uh, I mentioned the stupa at Sanchi had been discovered. He um, drove um, a, a shaft into, deep into the stupa to find out what was inside. And he found inside uh, a Buddhist inscription of the Gupta period confirming that Buddhism had been widespread for several centuries since the Mauryan period. He also found the remains of two leading disciples of the Buddha who had been buried there. He then went on to Sarnath and excavated a large collection of Buddhist sculpture there, most of which he shipped off to the Asiatic Society in Calcutta, and they're now in the Calcutta Museum. And he um, later lamented that when he went back there, many of the, he found many of the stones he had left behind were being used to dam a nearby river. And this was a perennial problem which the Orientalists were fighting with a battle to rescue Indian sites and to rescue their finds because no sooner were their backs turned than the stones would disappear and would be used in some form of local construction. Because uh, Indians have a habit, which we still see, of using uh, any old structures that can be found to make new ones. So these stones were, were a perfect sort of building material to be uh, taken and used in building local village homes, etc. So uh, these sites often disappeared completely within years if the stones were not taken off to a museum. Now, um, Cunningham retired in 1861 as a general, and he lived on for another 20 years, during which he spent his time leading the archaeological department in India. And he was appointed director general of a new department of archaeology, which was set up by the Viceroy Lord Curzon. And archaeological uh, survey of India, which is still very much in existence. The one problem that uh, Cunningham and a lot of other British Orientalists had was with Hindu eroticism because they somehow felt this was uh, indecent. It sort of somehow outraged their, their Western tastes. I mean, even the Yakshi here is, is a bit explicit for Victorian uh, Brits. And so they tended to avoid the, uh, the, um, uh, the Hindu ar erotic architecture. And, but nevertheless, Cunningham did discover and conserve Khajurao, so the eroticism didn't put him off Khajurao. But on the whole, he concentrated on Buddhist architecture and art, art which was somehow safer because it, was less, it, it wasn't at all erotic, in fact, the Buddhist art, um, uh, sculptures. Now, during his travels in the Punjab, Cunningham discovered Taxila, which was the great site of Gandharan sculpture. And then he discovered Harappa, which was um, found to be, you know, the prehistoric Indus Valley culture. Uh, and he discovered that the nearby Lahore Multan railway lines, which were being built, were using the bricks from the Harappan site. So he uh, quickly put a stop to that. And his last major discovery was the Bharut stupa, which was full of Mauryan Buddhist treasures. And I will show you here. This is the famous Bharut railing, which was, whether it was in fragments, it was pieced together, and it's now in the Calcutta Museum. Um, he found, when, when he was excavating these uh, pieces in Bharut, there were large crowds who he said were very disappointed that he found no treasure. And he, he confided to his diary, few natives of India have any belief in disinterested excavation for the discovery of ancient buildings. Their only idea of such exca excavations is that they are uh, really intended as a search for hidden treasure. And from the incredulous look of many of the people, I have no doubt that I was regarded as an arch deceiver who was studiously concealing the revelations made by the inscriptions as to the position of the buried treasures. Speak very highly of um, India's antiquarian interests at that stage, but I'm sure we've evolved a lot since then. But unfortunately, when he returned to Bharut three years later, in 1876, every remaining stone of the Bharut stupa 
had been removed by locals to build houses. And uh, that was, uh, so what he salvaged and took to Calcutta is what survives. Uh, now, I mentioned uh, his discovery of Taxila, and we have here a um, sort of classic Bodhisattva figure from, Cal uh, from um, Taxila, and prompted an interesting discussion about Indian versus Western art, because it was, um, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, very influenced by the, the Greek um, kingdom which Alexander left behind, and it was a kind of fusion of Indian and Greek uh, aesthetics. And there was quite a debate among the Victorians as to whether Gandharan art was, um, um, was fine art, and it appealed much more to the Western aesthetic than a lot of Indian art, or, or whether it was somehow bastardized and um, a hybrid which didn't belong to either West or East. Now, Cunningham was a great fan of it, but someone who came after Cunningham, and is the other big figure on the Indian um, art history scene, was not a fan of it, and that was Ernest Havel. Um, and Havel played an enormous role in the rediscovery of uh, Indian art from an aesthetic point of view rather than an archaeological point of view. And he completely re revolutionized the way that, the, that Indian art was seen by Western eyes. Um, he came in 1890 as principal, I've got a picture of him there, as principal of the Madras School of Art, and he left 20 years later as head of the Calcutta School of Art. He was very opposed to the fashion in both these schools of art and the JJ School of Art here for teaching a kind of Anglo-Indian um, uh, form of uh, painting. Uh, he wanted to revive traditional Indian um, techniques and his approach to in Indian art was summed up when he said, no European can understand or appreciate Indian art who does not divest himself of his Western preoccupations, endeavor to understand Indian thought, and place himself at the Indian point of view. So he saw the, again, he emphasized that the Indian aesthetic, as I mentioned earlier, was conceptual rather than representational, and this was something Western viewers needed to, to uh, take on board. That is why images were stylized and not naturalistic, and that there was no attempt at academic, at anatomical accuracy as there was in Greco-Roman art. The emphasis was on an anonymous spirituality rather than the individuality of either the subject or the artist, because most Indian art uh, had no known artist. It was done by several people or an anonymous person. And he also said that the multi-limbed and many-headed deities, which a lot of Westerners uh, look down on, were an allegorical representation of divine attributes, and no more physiologically impossible than Christian angels, for example, he, or, or the Greek gods. He pointed out that animals, too, were depicted by their essence rather than their anatomy. And I pointed out the elephants earlier. Um, but uh, Havel, uh, even Havel, f uh, did not embrace Hindu eroticism and he ignored it and didn't mention it as much as possible. Um, Havel took on the theory that Ajanta was the work of foreign artists and he dismissed it. He said its claim to be Indian was, and I quote, as valid as that of the school of Athens to be called Greek, that of those of Italy to be called Italian, and perhaps stronger than that of the schools of Oxford to be considered English. He emphasized the continuity from Ajanta down to the Mughal miniatures uh, of more recent times in the distinctively Indian conceptual approach of both. He credited Indian artists with the ability, quote, to see with the mind, not merely with the eye, to bring out an essential quality, not just the common appearance of things, to give movement and character in a figure, not only the bone and muscle, to reveal some precious quality or effect in a landscape, not merely physiographical or botanical facts, and above all, to identify himself with the inner consciousness of the nature he portrays. 
So this is, a, I think, a, a, you know, an unsurpassed summing up of um, the Indian aesthetic. Um, he clashed with those uh, very violently who uh, felt that India only excelled at decorative arts, and this was quite a common view at the time, not what was called fine art. And in 1910, Havel, there was a famous meeting of the Royal so Society of Art in London at which Havel took on his opponents. It was a very stormy meeting. It was chaired by someone called Sir George Birdwood, who was an old India hand and an authority on Indian traditional craft. And he chaired the meeting and he attacked uh, Havel and declared, now Havel showed this photograph of the Sarnath Buddha as an example of how Indian fine art could not possibly be denied uh, the label of fine art and compared with the best fine art anywhere in the world. And is nothing more than an uninspired brazen image vacuously squinting down its nose to its thumbs, knees, and toes. A boiled suet pudding, he said, would serve equally well as a symbol of passionless purity and serenity of soul. Well, anyway, I mean, I uh, leave you to judge whether that was, uh, that is comparable to a boiled suet pudding, uh, but certainly have a thought not. Interestingly, at that meeting, someone who was present was Anand Kumaraswamy, who many of you will have heard about, who took on Havel's mantle. And I don't know whether one should call uh, Kumaraswamy British or Indian. He was actually uh, the product of an in English mother and a Sinhalese father, uh, brought up in England and thoroughly anglicized. But he was then, for the next half century, the authority on Indian art. And we have, uh, um, you know, all been familiar with his work. Now, I, I think I'm, I'm possible. Am I running up against the clock? Yeah. How long? Five minutes. Five minutes. OK, I'll be quick. Uh, I haven't really talked about Islamic art, but I think there was much discussion about whether Muslim domes and arches originated in India or abroad, whether they originated in the stupas of Indian Buddhism or in the Hindu chhatris, or were they imports from Central Asia and the Middle East. Havel argued that the arch had traveled from east to west and originated in the horseshoe-shaped arch archways of Buddhist stupas. Uh, now, I'll show you a building which, oh, that's Kumaraswamy, which was um, really put on the uh, map by Havel, who uh, felt, uh, who discovered this fort, which had been built by Rajput uh, rulers as a, with, as a Hindu uh, fort before the Mughal forts at Agra and Delhi. And uh, Havel and later Edwin Lutyens, who built New Delhi, both much admired uh, Gwalior Fort and thought it was the inspiration for a lot of later Mughal architecture. They also much admired two wonderful Rajput palaces. Um, this is one. This is um, Orcha in Madhya Pradesh in a very ruined state. I think it's in an even worse state now. Um, it's one of the great um, architectural sites of India, very neglected, but much admired by um, 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 both Lachans and um, um, Havel. And this is Dhatia Fort, which again is, shows the fort growing out of the hillside in the way that the temples in Mahabalipuram grew out of the rocks. And Havel pointed out, you know, the sculptural aspect of this fort, which was very different from what the Mughals built. And uh, Lachans drew on both Dathya and Orcha for some of the motifs he later used in New Delhi in the designs around uh, the um, New Delhi buildings. So uh, I think these two buildings are also an example of how uh, India has really neglected one, you know, some of its greatest architectural treasures, which people like Havel were extolling, you know, 150 years ago. Now, 
Um, I'll also quickly say that uh, the Mughal monuments uh, surprising uh, and it, it does show India's neglect of, of heritage. Mughal monuments as recently built as Aurangzeb Pearl's, Aurangzeb's Pearl Mosque in the Red Fort or Humayun's tomb in Delhi were in ruins in the 19th century, in the 18th century, in fact, when the British discovered them and renovated them and uh, they had foliage grow growing through them, etc. Under the later Mughals, the Red Fort, Diwan e Am and Diwan e Khas had been turned into slums. People were sleeping and living there, uh, defecating there. Semi precious stones were being stolen from the um, um, Pietra Dura inlays. British um, tried to intervene, although they were not in charge. I mean, the Mughal ruler still. Uh, existed in Delhi. The Jama Masjid, which was in great decline, was rescued by talented British engineers in 1824. Um, so I think the British, during the, after the mutiny, they were, there was some British vandalism in the Red Fort. They destroyed the Zanana quarters. But I think they more than made up for it by what they conserved. And then Curzon made major restorations in 1904, including the return of these marble inlay um, friezes behind the throne in the Diwan e Khas. These had been taken off by a British officer to London and he turned them into tabletops. And eventually the V&A Museum acquired them and Curzon got them from the V&A and put them back where they are now behind the, the throne. Uh, the Taj, of course, was restored by the British from the 1780s onwards. Uh, the, all, the, it's the one monument all the British loved. Kipling described it as the ivory gate through which all dreams pass. Curzon restored its gateways and gardens and said, if I've ever done anything else in India, I have written my name here, and the letters are a living joy. Here's Curzon. And... Um, he restored the, uh, the Agra and Delhi forts, he restored Humayun's and Akbar's tombs, and he also restored the gardens, and he brought a British romantic sensibility for wild gardens to the previously very formal Mughal pattern of laying out gardens. And finally, I'm going to end with Mohenjo-daro, which was again now discovered in the Sindh desert by a young Bengali assistant of Sir John Marshall. Sir John Marshall is pictured here, who was direct Director General of the Archaeological Department set up by Curzon. It was Marshall who identified this as being the Indus Valley and linked it with what was happening in Harappa. And um, it was... Um, uh, uh, Marshall, who, who also pointed out the amazing geometrical precision of the layout, the grid on which it had been laid, the sophistication of the way this city had been laid out. Uh, you can see some of it here. And uh, the link with Harappa, this uh, was the famous bull seal from Harappa, which again mystified uh, British Orientalists because the bull didn't look like an Indian bull. It didn't have a hump. And the um, uh, script <laughs> totally is a pictographic script, which totally defied all linguists and continues to. So, but it, uh, nevertheless, it was discovered. Now, I'm going to end with the uh, question of cultural ownership, because I don't know if some of you have heard of, I'm, I'm sure all of you have heard of the Elgin marbles. I'm not sure if uh, some of you have heard of the Elliot marbles. Uh, the Elliot marbles were discovered in the Amravati Buddhist stupa, and uh, they were initially discovered by a Scotsman called Colin Mackenzie, who was another great explorer and mathematician, etc. In the 17 in the 1790s, they were then forgotten again for half a century and rediscovered by Sir Walter Elliot, who was a civil servant in the Madras presidency government, and he was sent out to do uh, a topographical survey of Madras presidency, because the other thing the British did was they surveyed and mapped every part of India, so not just discovering its archaeological and artistic sites, but its um, geography. And uh, Eliot stumbled on the Amravati ruins, 
And um, he then, um, in the course of this survey, and I'm going to cut short this account a bit, but um, you see here, uh, this is Elliot with some of his Indian guides. And, so, sorry, this is the um, Amravati, um, sorry, uh, I'm, yeah, the, uh, this, actually this is Elliot, um, for that, the previous one was Mackenzie, I'm jumping a bit now. This is Elliot, he's a rather old man. This is the um, Amravati stupa, and these are the, uh, this is an example of the Amravati marbles, which were called marbles, so they're, they're, they're a very fine white limestone. And uh, Elliot took as many as of, the, uh, of the finest examples as he could to Madras with him, and they were set up in the Madras Museum for a long time, and then some of them were shipped off to England, where they went through various museums and eventually ended up in the British Museum, which now has a specially climate-controlled room where they are displayed, a whole room is given to them. And they're one of the highlights of the British Museum, and they're also seen there in the context of global Buddhism. Uh, and there are major study centers at the British Museum of global Buddhism funded by the Japanese and other Buddhist countries. So they have a place there in global Buddhist art. However, there's been a strong demand from the Archaeological Survey of India for them to be returned in the way that uh, there is a demand for the Elgin marbles to be returned. It is worth saying that the Amravati um, uh, stupa itself, which is, I showed you earlier, is very neglected and hardly visited. There is a collection of Amravati sculpture still in the Madras Museum, which is one of its least visited rooms, but still the archaeological survey wants it back. And I just think this whole question, it raises this whole question of cultural ownership. Who do they belong to? The people who initially valued them, discovered them, saved them, and are now seeing them in a global, making them available in a global context, or should they come back to Amravati? So I think I'm going to leave it there on this question of cultural ownership, and I'm happy to take any questions. Mentioned about the contribution of William Jones. Sorry, I can't. William read. Jones. Yes. Yeah. But I am afraid the greatest contribution of William Jones was in the study of language where he found the affinity in Greek, Sanskrit, Latin, etc. And thereby what he propounded about the first, he of course said that it was an Aryan race and all that. Now it is no longer considered a race. It, scholars are veering down to the view that it was a linguistic group. But anyway, whatever may be the position. But the point was that was the starting point of great research not only in India but also in Germany which led to the study of the entire Sanskrit literature, Pali literature, etc. So that, that was perhaps the biggest contribution of William Jones in the preservation and the discovery of Indian heritage. That is one thing I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. The other thing I uh, somehow uh, wanted to add is that you have uh, omitted to mention the name of Fleet, who was a great authority of our Indian epigraphy and his contribution in the... Sorry, you repeat, you repeat Fleet, it. George Fleet. Fleet. Okay. He has written uh, Pardon very my good ignorance. collections of Indian inscriptions. Right. So I think that was a uh, significant omission, I think. Uh, uh, I apologize. While I think many of us are in general agreement with your kind of positive description of British Orientalists, we do have several even current political issues which are a direct result of uh, kind of imaginings of British Orientalists, if you will. The entire Dravidian movement and the uh, Tamil extremist movement comes from Bishop Caldwell's um, uh, understanding of Tamil grammar and his imaginary description of a Dravidian race. Uh, Todd in Rajasthan has created, uh, you know, he thought uh, the Rajputs were clans like Scotland or something. He was influenced by Walter Scott and he has created a total imaginary, which still bedevils 
the political landscape of India. So, I mean, there is a reason for us to worry about Orientalism. Yes, Jones and, and people like that, uh, they are the positive side, but there is, there is this concern, and I think you need to address that. You can't duck out of that. No, I won't duck it. I think what you point out is that they made mistakes scratch, uh, studying a culture that was completely new to them. Uh, it's not surprising that they did make mistakes, that they did get carried away by certain red herrings uh, and so on. However, I do think that they did an enormously positive task as against that in a lot of the ethnographic and anthropological work that was done, especially around tribals, especially around identifying the iniquities of the Indian caste system and exposing it. You know, uh, until the British came along, who was there to actually talk about what the uh, Nairs and, uh, and uh, Mudri Brahmins were doing to the uh, untouchables in Kerala? Uh, it, you know, the, all, this is all very much part of the, a kind of nationalist myth that the British invented caste, that the British invented categories by naming them. The point is, yes, they did make some mistakes, but they named a lot of very relevant categories of so, which became the subject of social policy. And without them, it's very, it probably have taken another couple of centuries for India to have evolved that kind of recognition of a lot of its own communities, especially the most dispossessed, the tribals uh, who were totally outside the Hindu caste system, uh, treated even worse than the untouchables. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dr. Masani. But uh, I tend to agree with what was uh, said. I just would like to make a few other, a few other remarks on that in the sense that uh, uh, maybe won't be like uh, you know Ochalan says that the whole system of science brought in by the West has to be thrown out as Orientalism no doubt the British introduced a system of studying history in India but at the same time uh, would you not agree that their study of history was slanted I mean uh, no doubt there may have been a few people like William Jones or others who studied Sanskrit who had this, but there was a definite slant, even as was pointed out about William Jones in his theorizing about the Aryans, for instance, or of, uh, that this was a take up from the Aryans. So there was a slant and uh, it's not as if uh, Edward Said talks only about culture, Edward Said talks of the economics. It's not, it is a fact that they maimed the Dhaka Muslim workers, for instance. No, no, it's not a fact. But, but, but subject of another lecture, this e economic thing, water by uh, Reed Tilkankar Roy in the Economic and Political Weekly. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, when you say slant, what is the slant? Can you define the slant? The slant is precisely this, that it, the civilization came from the West and that the Western civilization came here as a no, civilizing sorry. mission. Sorry, the slant was, if anything, the other way, which because people like Jones and Havel were trying to argue that it was from the East, from Sanskrit, from Indian civilization that the West learned. They argued that the arch came from India. They argued that Sanskrit was the mother of your Indo-European, of the European classical languages. Uh, it, they, Havel argued that uh, Hindu uh, and Buddhist um, art and architecture was far superior to anything the West had produced. No, it may be, see, there may have been a few, I say, a few like, okay, anyways, we won't, I mean, won't take up much more time in this, it will take a much longer discussion than this. But uh, if there is a way in which we were to analyze the, um, uh, uh, the history, let us say Grant's history of the Marathas, you would see Shivaji as nothing more than a Mountain thief. And was he that much more? He was I mean, something more people, than a mountain thief. A lot thief. of people argue that Shivaji has been totally magnified and exaggerated. May, no doubt, may, maybe uh, that way either. But, he, but on the other if hand, you would not a, be able to call you know, him just to think a. about Shivaji is somewhere either. in between, probably. It, precisely. It yeah. may be somewhere yeah. in between. Yeah. But so you need a debate. But the British didn't shut down the debate. So what Grant wrote 
something uh, people like Ronald Day and others wrote uh, contrary stuff. There was a debate that went Because on. when you said that over the 1830s was a period of discovery in Bihar, it was a period when the British were encouraging the whole of Bihar to grow opium for the opium trade at the same time. Yes, but uh, you know, what is the connection? Discussion can anyway, <laughs> it's a non sequitur. Why do you say we had such neglect of these beautiful monuments? When they were built, were they kind of, didn't they think of maintaining them in future or they just, what's your take on it, sir? Well, through Europe went through something called the Dark Ages in which uh, classical Greek and Roman uh, architecture and monuments fell into total disrepair and um, decay and, you know, Rome, half of Rome w collapsed and was being raided for stones like some of the Indian monuments I mentioned. Um, so it was only with the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance in Europe that the classical period, European classical period was rediscovered and cultivated and there was this European taste for classical antiquities, for ruins. Then you had the Romantic movement in the late 18th, uh, early 19th century which was fascinated by ruins to, uh, in wilderness, etc. So that sensibility is what the British brought to India at their best. And it wasn't at all at that time a part of Indian culture because, I mean, um, the uh, Mughal elite were not in the least bit interested in Hindu monuments uh, and certainly not in the sculpture which they found quite offensive mostly. The uh, Hindu elite had pretty much been Mughalized in many ways and again uh, the emphasis was on novelty. You know, you built a new palace, you didn't uh, restore the old one. That was the way you showed your wealth, your uh, privilege, your status, by building new. Dr. Veen Vasani, for your erudite lecture. Uh, first of all, before I say anything, I must thank uh, Dr. Vaishampayan for having uh, invited me, me to preside over this uh, Mani Kamerkar Memorial Lecture. I was uh, associated with Dr. Mani Kamerkar for a long time as one of our junior colleagues. Uh, I remember we traveled together to attend the Indian History Congress at Bhubaneswar from Bombay. And of course, when I was the, in the University Department of History, she was in the SNDT University. And co we cooperated together at that time in framing the syllabus for the postgraduate classes of the Bombay University. I have got very good uh, memories and I had spoken once again in, uh, in uh, Andheri College, Bhavan's College, on a another uh, memorial lecture of uh, uh, Dr. Kamerkar. So I was indeed very happy when uh, I was invited to preside over this function. And secondly, uh, I attended the meeting, uh, Bombay Times uh, uh, Literary, uh, the, this thing at uh, Mehbu Studio, and uh, I have seen the battle between uh, him and uh, our learned politician. And after having listened to their arguments, I said, I must, I have an opportunity now to meet him personally and see how well, because he at that time impressed me during that public talk as one of the persons who has a wealth of knowledge, especially in uh, his argument with Shashi Tharu. It is a very interesting debate there. So I am indeed happy to be here this afternoon to preside over this function. I may not have much to add to what he has said, but to supplement what he has said, I may say, there were three kind of Orientalists. One, the civil servants, 
the second the military men and third the missionaries all europeans one of the and there are only two such societies one the first was was the asiatic society royal asiatic society of bengal uh, and then second was this and these two were the branches of the british uh, oriental society which was responsible for this kind of a revival of learning what had happened when these people took up because the missionaries the military men as well as the civil servants took up this as a kind of a special task in addition to their normal functioning normal service as civil servant for example this mackintosh and jones they were the high court judges but that they took this of interest and there were military men like van kennedy and others who took up this and there were missionaries like john wilson who was a president of the asiatic society they were all orientalists and the, and there are only two in the country one was uh, calcutta and another was bombay and this very society where we are sitting this society also has made very significant contribution to the understanding and the revival of course william jones and princeps have made significant contribution to the revival of the uh, indian understanding in indian learning indian culture uh, uh, in the country and uh, one the, one thing used to happen was those who were in calcutta always received prominence because that was the center of the government at that time and we were in one sense the outlying provinces bombay though here there were, there, were, there were almost a dozen orientalists and including as i said john wilson was one of them he was one of the pioneers of the orientalists and uh, there is a correspondence between john wilson and james princeps and you spoke about the girnar ins- inscription and uh, it was captain lang who took the transcript of that facsimile of that uh, girnar inscription and that was at the instance of john wilson uh, who was on his tour there and he saw this girnar inscription and he wanted to study that and he made his notes on in deciphering what was written there because in of the in uh, ashokan inscriptions then there was a correspondence between them and he sent it with his notes and to that the john wilson sent it to him and james princep wrote back to john wilson saying that you could have done this yourself because the decipherment of the brahmi script in 1842 by princeps one of the you can say a remarkable achievements because what as he he said already that we would not have known the history of modern empire and calling ashoka one of the greatest rulers of the world and that would that was possible because of the work of james princep uh, with these few words i thought i may add something to what he has already said to us at this has been a very enlightening evening i want to thank the uh, secretary and the president and the managing committee for giving me this opportunity to be here with you and to dr meer masani for your erudite lecture thank you very much Zareen Masani for giving us your perspective on the role of prominent Englishmen in rediscovering India's past. And Scotsman. And Scotsman, of course, they're looking, well, one of them is right behind you, so um, he's watching you. Uh, and uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. John Wilson is also gazing at you. So I'm glad you watched your words when you spoke about them. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there will always be room 
for debate and uh, controversy. Um, but um, sitting there and watching all your slides, I really appreciated the tour I had uh, this evening, comfortably seated in the Darbar Hall. Thank you so much. I thought those slides were wonderfully done. And um, I think you did point out several important features. And uh, in a way, I think you have today renewed our sense of pride in our magnificent monuments and our magnificent past. So we appreciate very much that you agreed to come here and share all this with us today. Dr. David, I'm so happy that we have been seeing you more often lately than we did uh, earlier. And I hope you will continue to come whenever we ask you to preside or present. And um, I know how well you know Dr. John Wilson and what you've written. Uh, I'm also very proud that I'm a Wilsonian and I share that with uh, Dr. David. And uh, I think I saw Dr. John Wilson uh, looking quite happily at you when you spoke about all that he did. And he was also known as a polymath and in many ways a founder of the Bombay that uh, we have at present inherited from them. Um, a very interesting session, I'm sure you will all agree. Thank you everybody for coming here this evening. Good night.